Today we're going to be uh, continuing in our sermon series of knowing scripture to change our future. Today we're talking about let us be thankful and we are finishing up Hebrews chapter 12. So we're going to be in he excuse me, Hebrews chapter 12 verses 14 through 18. Hebrews chapter 12 verses 14 through 18 and I hope that you'll have that open in front of you. We will read that entire text as we uh, finish up the mini-series inside of our larger series today. So let's go ahead and go before God in prayer, and then we'll get right into our message. Father, we are so thankful for all that you give us, and we are thankful for this moment to be able to be together and to be challenged by your word and for the opportunity to continue moving through Hebrews chapter 12. And as we wrap it up today, Father, to see how you bring into account everything from run your race to reminding us about the new covenant and the beauty of the grace and the mercy that you offer. And because of that, we should be so thankful. So Lord, bless us this morning. And as I, as I preach a sermon today, Father, I pray simply this, that you carry the words to the hearts and the minds of each and every single person. And that you, Father, do as you see fit. But most importantly, let us be attentive. Let us, let us hear with new ears. Let us hear with an open heart. Because Father, you speak to us in your word all the time. So bless us now and be with us, please, for it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So we continue in our series this morning as we are looking at biblical accounts that we've all read and heard many times in our life. But today I want us to listen as we do each and every single week with new and attentive ears. And here's the reason why. Because the Lord has a way of using his word to speak directly into our life at just the right time in a way that we've never heard it before if we are willing to listen to him. Now Jesus said in John chapter 14 verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So if you believe what Jesus is saying, that he is the truth, and by the way, that truth is what you and I need in our life in order one day to be able to be in the presence of God himself and, uh, in heaven, then we must seek the truth of Jesus Christ. Now Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 32, if you hold to my teachings, that's the Bible, then you're really my disciples, and then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So I pray that we want our future to be better. I pray that we want our life to be more rooted in Christ and in his word. However, in order to really change our future, we need not only to know the scriptural lessons it teaches, but then actually apply them to our life because they are timeless. And no matter where we are in our journey, we have to have them. So true freedom, according to Jesus, comes from knowing scripture and following what it says. But what are we free from? Well, we're free from sin. But we can break it down to things like fear and shame and guilt and the culture and people's opinions and self-centeredness, self-pity, anger, arrogance, and we could go on and on. We're reminded each and every single week that there are two ways that we can change our future. One is simply this. It's to the better. And that is, in other words, to take the word of God, study the scripture, and then let it transform not only our thinking, but our entire life. Or there is the second way. Just keep doing what the world wants you to do and keep evolving with the world, keep changing with the world, and you will change. But I promise it'll be to the worse. It is your choice. God created you as a free will person. So it's your choice. Here's the question that you must wrestle with. What are you going to do with this opportunity to change? Are you going to squander it? Or are you going to actually become what God created you to be? So this morning, we continue by looking at this familiar passage, and we're looking at the last portion of Hebrews chapter 12, let us be thankful. So if you'll follow along with me, starting in verse 14, all the way through the end of the chapter, this is what it reads. Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up that causes trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterwards, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. He could bring about no change of mind, though he sought the blessing with tears. You have not come to a mountain that cannot or that can be touched and that is burning with fire to darkness, gloom, or storm, to a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it will be stoned. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, 
I am trembling with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what has been shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. So in this mini-series that we have done now in Hebrews chapter 12, we have covered how as an individual we must run our race. There is absolutely nothing easy, by the way, about this race that you and I have to run. In this falling world, we will have pain. And by the way, it's often going to happen to us when we least expect it. However, we must not stop running. Our Father in heaven will meet us wherever we are, and we would not and we should not run alone. But let me tell you what we do have to do. We do have to run and we do have to finish the race. You see, the running is where most people want to give up. When the pain hits, when the frustration begins to set in, or when you just don't feel that fire or joy that you felt at first. And that is precisely when we need our Father the most. When we need Him to meet us right where we are and that we lean on Him so that we might be able to cross the finish line and be where God wants us to be. You see, we have a great cloud of witnesses around us who have faced what we are going through and even worse, telling us, keep going. Don't give up. And we have a great number of our brothers and sisters with us in Christ, by the way, who are watching us right now, who are saying, don't give up. And we have people who have yet to make a decision about Jesus Christ, who are watching the way you and I live our life, and they are saying, will they live what they say they believe? Or will they just walk away from Jesus when things don't go the way that they want them to go? Run the race that God has marked out specifically for you because your life is a witness to those around you. You are being watched. Do not surrender your faith. Fight like you've never fought before because your faith matters. Hold on to the cross of Christ and live by the highest standard you live by as Christ has called us because what you proclaim, the way you live your life is what you proclaim about Jesus. So what is your life saying to those who are watching? Week number two, we talked about the fact that because Jesus endured all that he did for you and I, for our forgiveness, surely we can endure what you and I are going through. We should see our hardships as discipline from God. And remember, discipline is teaching. It is training. It is an encouragement to do the right thing. We have that Greek word paraklesis, which is actually the English word encourage. It means to call someone to be encouraged or to console either by verbal or nonverbal means to lift up. And then we have that Greek word paideia, which is the English word discipline. And this is what it means, to punish or train for the purpose of improved behavior, whether it is exercised on someone by others or by themselves. And we talked about the meaning of that and deeper. So discipline is an encouragement to change your behavior or your action from what you are doing or from that which is wrong to that which is right. And since God loves you and I as his children, he will do whatever it takes to encourage us to do the right thing by him and not the right thing by the world. Stand firm in who you are in Christ. Know that he loves you and that he wants only the best for you. So when you feel frustrated, consider Jesus. When you don't want to work in the kingdom, consider Jesus. When you skip sharing Jesus with others because you don't want to feel embarrassed or have somebody talk about you, consider Jesus. And when you wake up tired on a Sunday morning and you think about staying home and not wanting to go to hear Jesus Christ be proclaimed or to sing praise songs, consider Jesus. Consider all that Jesus endured for you because he loves you and consider how much you mean to him 
and then you can stand firm in who you are because you are saved in Christ Jesus. So today, as we wrap it up, we're going to look at why we should be thankful for our, for our salvation because being a child of God is so much better than being a child of the world. Remember, you cannot love both the world and God. Now let me say that one more time. You cannot love both the world and God. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15-17. through 17. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of the sinful man, the lust of his eyes, the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. So let's be honest here. There are times that we just need to be warned or reminded of the warnings about the world, about life, and about the things that we fall in love with, in love with because we can get so caught up in doing the things that we always do that we convince ourselves it's okay with God. And the fact is, quite frankly, it's not. So let us be thankful for the Word of God so that we can search the truth and then know the truth that we might be able to be free. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and get into our first point this morning. Our first point is simply this, live in peace. Now look with me, if you will, one more time in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 through 18. Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral. Or as godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterwards, as you know, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. He could bring about no change of mind, though he sought the blessing with tears. Now, I'm going to be very honest with you this morning as we start off. This is probably the hardest thing in the world to do today. To live at peace with all men. The left hates the right. The right hates the left. Socialists hate freedom. Every freedom-loving person hates oppression. But there, the presence of non-peaceful people doesn't stop in the political realm either. It's not just stuck in that area. You will find those who are not peaceful or not at peace in the church at large as well. And it's sad, but it's true. There are some people in the church that are troublemakers, that are grumblers, that always have a complaint about something. They're gossipers, they're criticizers, they're self-centered, they're self-absorbed. And when people act in this manner, it really is all about them. It's not about God at all. It's always about what they are getting and not about what they're giving back to God. And when you find people like this, they are not at peace with themselves and they're not at peace, by the way, with their relationship with Jesus. Thus, they cannot be at peace with those around them, let alone the body of believers. Now here's what's sad. They will act like they are. They will even tell you that they are. But the fact is they're not. And because they are not truly at peace with God, they become dissenters. They become dividers. They become ego hunters. They become anything that will make them feel better about themselves, about what they say, about what they do, and about how they act. And they will do anything to justify the trouble they stir up, not only in their lives, but anywhere they are actually at. As Christians, as we who are mature in Christ, we must be able to see when people are doing these things and learn to reject that kind of behavior. And in love, by the way, call that brother or sister out on their action. And in doing so, prayerfully pray that their life is corrected, that their behavior is changed, and that their eyes are open to what they're doing. You see, that is what the believer's job is. To seek peace with all people, no matter what. And that is to work to bring peace between people and Jesus Christ. That's the very reason why we exist. To share the peace of Jesus with a very lost and a very dark world. We are to work to the best of our ability to seek to have peace and harmony with as many people as we can. But also remember this. Peace and harmony are not always in our control. And peace is not always possible with everyone. We should do what we can to give the gospel out to as many people as possible. But what happens 
when a person refuses to accept the gospel? Or what happens when a person refuses to see what they're doing is against the will of God, and therefore they refuse to repent of their ways? Well, that's an excellent question. And by the way, Jesus gave the answer to that question when he was sending the 72 out into the town ahead of him. And you'll find that, by the way, in Luke chapter 10. Jesus says, listen, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And then Jesus begins to tell the 72 what they are to do when they go into towns. And this is what he says in Luke chapter 10, verses 8 through 12. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat whatever is set before you. Heal the sick that are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near to you. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into the streets and say, even the dust of your town that sticks to our feet is wiped off against you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God is near. Then Jesus said, I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than it will be for that town. You see, God is calling his children to be holy Now, remember what that word means because it's imperative that we understand that word. The Greek word hagiosmos. Hagiosmos is the English word for holy, and this is what it means. To be sanctified, to be consecrated, to be dedicated to God, to be set apart, to be different. And for that very reason, God calls us to be holy in all that we try to do, bringing peace to people between them and God. Listen to what it says once again in Hebrews 12, verse 14. Make every effort to live in peace with all men, and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. We should never allow evil to overcome good. And yet, that's what many Christians often do. Now this verse, by the way, is not calling you and I to live perfect. It's not calling us to live perfectly at all. We can't do that. We will never be perfect. And if you think you are perfect, your thinking's already flawed. So there's a problem already. But in doing all that we can to bring peace with people, we are still called to stand firm in Christ Jesus and with the gospel message. In other words, we are to never allow evil to overcome good or to replace or alter the good of God due to evil. In other words, become accepting of sin because that's just what everybody does. We can't do that. Now why? And what do I mean by this? We must always stand firm in the truth. Why? Because truth does not change. We must always remain firm in the gospel because the gospel does not change. And we must be willing to defend the word of God in his church always because he paid for it with his blood. But why be so adamant about these things? Well, because we are called to. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 15 through 17. See to it that no one misses the grace of God that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterwards, as you know, he wanted to inherit this blessing. He was rejected. He could not bring about any change of mind, though he sought the blessing with tears. Because we want to do everything that we can to ensure that everyone comes in contact and not miss out on this wonderful gift called the grace of God that leads them to salvation, because of that, we must do what we're called to do. But if we do not stand against evil or that which is against the will of God, we will find some that will allow bitterness to take root in their lives, and that bitterness will lead to division, it'll lead to divisiveness, it'll lead to a lack of desire to serve, it'll lead to other troubles that will wreck relationships, and not only relationships with their brothers and sisters in Christ, but with God as well. And as Christians, we must not let this happen. But we must also see that people do not live by their own version of Christianity as well, because this is so common today. The Hebrew writer compares this to the biblical account of Esau. Esau cared very little about his relationship with his father. He cared very little about it. He cared very little about his birthright, which by the way, the birthright was so important because it was his inheritance. And he cared very little about it as well. So he was willing to give all that up for a bowl of stew at that time. Now, you need to understand the significance of this because he cared so little about his future that he was willing to give up his future for a moment of pleasure. For a moment of fulfillment, he was willing to surrender his entire future. He surrendered his inheritance. Now, when it came time to receive his inheritance, he wanted it, but he was rejected. 
And there is nothing that he could do that would change the outcome of the poor decisions he made because he wanted to live the way he wanted to live and he squandered his inheritance, meaning he didn't do anything to maintain it or anything like that. And even though he begged with tears, it was not given to him. Now, what does that mean for you and I today on this side of the cross? Well, there are many Christians who want to live their life the way they want to live it. They want to live by their own version of Christianity, and they think it is absolutely okay. Why? Well, because deep down inside, they really don't care about their relationship with their Heavenly Father, and they could care very less or very little about their eternal inheritance. And so they live for the pleasure of the moments. They're willing to squander their eternity for the here and now. Why? Because they've convinced themselves that in the end, they're going to get their inheritance no matter what. Even though they rejected the life that God called them to live, they're going to still get their inheritance. But they won't. And when they stand before their Father in heaven and they plead with tears, the outcome will not be changed. Because they squandered the grace of God for their desire to live in the moment by their standards the way they wanted to do it and not by God's. And brothers and sisters, that is sad. It is terribly sad. And you see, we don't want that to happen to anybody. So we must do everything that we can to live in peace with all people so that nobody, and by the way, never compromise the gospel at all. And we must live holy because without holiness, you're never going to see Jesus. Let us all work together to ensure that everyone understands the grace of God and understands the grace in which they are called to live by, and that by being saved in Christ, they will reap the joy and the benefit of the new covenant under which every single one of us live. Which, by the way, will take us this morning to our next point. Which mountain are you on? Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 through 24. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched, that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, storm, to a tempest blast, or such a voice speaking words to those that heard it begged that no further words would be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touched the mountain, it must be stoned. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of the righteous men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and the blood sprinkled that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Now, we just talked about how we are called to see that no one misses the grace of God. And so the Hebrew writer reminds us that we have two approaches Two approaches in order to come into the presence of God. There are two ways to do that. There's the old covenant, which, by the way, existed all the way up until the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then there's the new covenant, which began after the resurrection of Jesus Christ with the beginning of the church and the New Test church of the New Testament in the book of Acts, chapter 2. Now, the old covenant was based on how well you lived according to the law of God, which, by the way, had to be lived out perfectly. So... In other words, you could say it was based on what you did according to the law of God. You see, the fact is, we can be saved by the law of God, but in order for you and I to be saved by the law of God, we must live every law code under which we live perfectly. Every set of rules that we live under must be followed perfectly. And here's what I mean by that. You are called to follow every rule and every law in this nation perfectly. Every rule and every law in the state, county, or city, perfectly. Including, by the way, every rule and everything that your parents set for you, perfectly. If you can follow every law code under which you live perfectly without fail, including the Levitical law, then you can approach God without fear of punishment. Here's the problem. Nobody can do that except Jesus. And for that reason, we cannot approach God without fear because we're all guilty of sin, and therefore we deserve to receive the full punishment of our sins. At least that's the way the old covenant called it. Romans chapter 3, verse 23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So the Hebrew writer reminds us that we do not come to a mountain that cannot be touched. In other words, 
We come to a mountain not based on our perfection by keeping the law. And that was the old covenant. That was Mount Sinai. By the way, this is where Mount Sinai is where the law was received by Moses and then given to the people where perfection was demanded in the, to be able to come into the presence of a perfect and holy God. Now, there are three things for you and I to keep in mind when we think about the old covenant. One, and I'm talking about how we approach God with the old covenant. First is simply this. The approach of the Old Covenant was an external and a physical thing. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, it was something that you had to do. It was based on your actions. And you had to go to Mount Sinai, a physical place, in order to come before God. And Mount Sinai, by the way, was a place that could be touched. In other words, that's the reason why the writer says that can be touched. Eventually, that, that place was going to fade away. It would not be there forever. It would eventually be shaken and destroyed by earthquakes and worn by weather. The second thing to keep in mind about this approach to the Old Covenant was that you were going before a holy and a distant God of judgment. And that's the reason why we see the symbolism of the three words. We have fire, which is always the imagery of holiness and righteousness and the purity of God. And when you approached God, you approached Him very carefully because you were sinful and you would be consumed. Then we see the darkness representing the fact that you and I, in the Old Covenant, could not see the fullness of God. We as men could not see that we could not fully understand who God was and what he was doing or how he was working to bring us back to him. And then there is, depending on your translation, tempest or storm, which is always the imagery of the judgment of God. He is God Almighty. He is the judge and he will pass out judgment to those who refuse his covenant law. Now we go to the third part of the approach. The approach of the old covenant was a reluctance and fear because the voice of God was strong. It was forceful. It struck fear in the hearts and the minds of people. Such fear that the people said to Moses in Exodus chapter 20, verses 18 to 19, as they stand at a distance, they said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we'll listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. Here's what I mean by all that. When you approach God through the old covenant, you need to be fearful and reluctant. You need to be. Why? Because the law of God will judge you because you have violated the law and there is a consequence to violating the law of God. You see, that is the consequence of living by your standards, living by the way you see fit in your life. It didn't work for Esau and it will not work for you and I. But that was the old covenant. That was Mount Sinai. But the new covenant, now that's different. See, the new covenant is not based on anything that I have done. It is based on what Jesus Christ has accomplished for me. Remember, the old covenant, had to, you had to live in a perfect way. You had to live perfectly by every law code. Jesus lived every law code perfectly, including the Levitical law, thus allowing him, by the way, to offer himself as the perfect sacrifice in my place and in your place. You see, the old covenant, something that was sinless had to die for that which was sinful. And that was the reason why the perfect unblemished lamb each year on the Day of Atonement had to be offered. The lamb itself had committed no sin. It was perfect in the sense that it was unblemished. And yet, it had to die to push back the sins of a family. Now, I say push back because you need to remember the death of an animal did not remove the sins of mankind. It was not capable of doing that, nor was it sufficient to do that. It merely pushed them back until the Savior, the Redeemer of God, would come and pay our debt and offer you and I the way to be saved. And through the Savior, through this Redeemer, we would be able to stand in the presence of God and be presented perfect, not based on what I was capable of doing, but based on what Jesus Christ, our Savior, did for us. Now, I do have to believe that Jesus is the Christ. I do have to have faith in what he did for me at Calvary's cross. I do have to repent of my sinful life. I do need to confess that he is Lord and Savior. I do need to be baptized in his death, burial, and resurrection for the forgiveness of my sins and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit as Acts chapter 2, verse 36 to 38 calls us to. But what saves me is the resurrection of Jesus Christ who, by the way, was victorious over sin and death, who is in heaven at God's right hand with all authority and submission to him. Listen to 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18-22. through 22. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous and the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom he went and preached to the spirits in prison who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. 
not for the removal of dirt from the body, but for the pledge of a good conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. So when I obey the plan of salvation, I am added to the body of Christ. Acts chapter 2, verse 38 through 40. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, for all whom our Lord will call. And with many words he warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. See, those who are part of the church... We can approach the throne room of God, biblically referred to as Mount Zion, and one day stand in the presence of our Heavenly Father, and we will be seen as perfect, as not guilty. Again, not because we lived perfectly, but because the one who who is perfect took my place, and now I am found in Him. Isaiah 61, verse 10, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me in garments of salvation. He has arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. You see, this is the grace that we don't want anyone to miss out on. This is the grace that saves all those who will come to Jesus Christ. And by this grace alone, can you and I stand in the presence of God and not be in fear of sin's punishment? Because if I am in Christ, the price has been paid. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And that is the new covenant. That is the grace that saves us from our sins. That is the grace that offers hope for eternity. That is the grace that causes you and I to desire to be in the presence of our Father in heaven because we know that this covenant agreement is no longer based on me or based on you. It is based on Jesus, and that is a beautiful gift that can only be found in Jesus Christ. And as long as I remain in Christ, I do not have to worry that somebody will remove me from that except for myself. You see, Mount Sinai was a place that could be shaken and destroyed. But Mount Zion cannot. Which, by the way, will take us this morning to our last point. Don't be shaken. We are running this race that's been marked out for each and every single one of us. And we must not refuse to follow Jesus and his word. In other words, we have to stop trying to run this race that God has marked out for us following our rules and not God's we got to stop doing that. Listen, we will never cross the finish line running this race by ourselves, and we will never finish properly if we try to run on our own and not lean on our Heavenly Father. And yet that's exactly what so many Christians try to do. They try to run their own race by their own set of rules, and it turns out to be a horrible mess. And we run this race, when we do it on our own, we find ourselves on very shaky ground. And by the way, that shaky ground will shake us right to the core. If we allow it to happen. Now what does that look like? Well when things don't go the way I think they should go. My faith is shaken to the core. When things seem to be going great. And all of a sudden something that we least expect happens. Our faith is shaken to the core. When we hear someone who does not desire to live in a peaceful manner. Talking about others. Complaining about others. Not acting the way that they should. Our faith is shaken to the core. When we believe that God should have responded differently to our situation, our faith is shaken to the core. But as your brother in Christ, I call upon you to strengthen yourself in the word of God, to root yourself in Christ Jesus, to heed his words, the one who died at Calvary's cross in order to set you free and offers you, by the way, a way to be saved from your sins. Turn to him and be redeemed. See, Jesus is offering you a kingdom not built on Mount Sinai, which is based on you and what you do. It's not on a mountain that will one day be destroyed. Jesus is offering you the opportunity to be part of the kingdom that is based on what he did located in Mount Zion that will never be shaken and never be destroyed. And I hope that's good news to you because it is to me. And all you need to do to be part of that kingdom is be in Christ Jesus. And so I urge you to follow the words of the one who gave it all for you. To be part of the kingdom that he bought with his own blood so that one day you can stand before your Father in heaven and desire to be there because of Jesus Christ and what he's done for you. 
Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. So let me ask you this morning, how's your race going? Are you enduring the hardships in life as God is gently moving you from where you are to where he wants you to be? From the wrong that you do to the right that he wants to see in your life? Are you fully enjoying the grace of God in your life or are you allowing the world to take it away by shaking your faith to the very core because it doesn't work out the way you think it should or because other people tell you, that's why I don't go to church because it doesn't work. Finally, are you living your life in such a way that shows that you're worshiping God in a manner that is acceptable with reverence and awe? Now, only you and Jesus really know that answer. I pray that you are, though, because, brothers and sisters, I don't want you to miss out on the wonderful grace of God that offers you peace that cannot be found anywhere but in Jesus. So let us be thankful that God has made a way that we can be saved. Friends, I invite you today to accept the grace of God by faith in what Jesus Christ did for you at Calvary's cross and in Christian baptism, bury your old self and arise as a brand new person in Jesus Christ, ready to live out the life that you and I are called to live the way that God says to live it. Not the world, not your own ideologies, but the way God says. So I don't know where you're at in this race, but you and Jesus do. 